with Lou from Sick of It All. a new album at the end of last year called yeah. Wake the Sleeping Dragon. Can yeah. you talk about the process of making that and any struggles you might have faced? Well, it was really, we gave ourselves a limited amount of time. We were all like, instead of like, we usually, uh, when we decide we're going to write, we take our time and blah, we said, all right, everybody go home for three weeks and write. Then we got together for three weeks and heard what, you know, each of us did. And then it was another three weeks of just, uh, <clears throat> demoing but in the studio with our producer that's the first time we've ever done that usually we just do it in, in a rehearsal studio with a little crappy digital recorder <laughs> and it's just all noise when you get home that's cool with our producer who's our friend Jerry uh, Jerry Farley he uh, he was an engineer on our last like four or five records and this time he produced and uh, working with him on the demoing was great because now we could sit there and hear if I'm singing the way Armine hears what he wrote. Like when Armine wrote lyrics, he has a certain way that he wants me to sing it, but when we would just do it in rehearsal, he can't really hear me. Yeah. So now it was great, you know. Uh, I think the hardest thing for me was when they would tell me, no, sing, pull back, pull back. Cause I'm usually like, you know, I'm gonna go in and scream this full throttle, you know, old yeah. school style, exploited yeah. discharge, go for it, you know. And I was like, no, no, pull back here, go there. And it worked. It yeah. yeah, and to get that direction of something different is what makes it work in the end, that you're getting that from an outside perspective. Yeah. And what's good, the album is sick of it all, but it's it's us, again, with a little difference, you know? It's not just a repeat of every record. Yeah. Maybe to the untrained ear, but to us it sounds different. Definitely. Well, so I read something that this is your first record back on Fat in 15 years. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So how is it being back on the label after such like a long sabbatical I mean, part? It's great. It, and it's, when we when we parted ways with Fat, it wasn't had anything to do with the American label. It was the European branch. We were so much bigger in Europe, but we weren't selling the records. Yeah. And then, uh, so we left Fat for that reason because Europe was our biggest market. And Mike always said, he was always like, no matter what, you're always on fat. You're still a fat family. And when they did their anniversary, uh, Propagandi couldn't get in the country. He flew us out to fill the spot. We're like, Mike, we haven't been on fat in like 10 years. Like, <laughs> doesn't matter. You're still a fat family. And it was awesome. That's but awesome. But being back, it's great because, you know, we love Mike and everybody. And, uh, yeah, and, it's, and we know they care about the music. Yeah. Uh, the label that, that they merged with Century Media, they're great for us in Europe. They kill it in Europe. But the American branch, they don't know what to do with hardcore. They're all more death metal and metal. You know? But you guys have a busy couple months coming up in March and April. Yeah. You're hitting the road to tour the East Coast and Europe. Yeah. What kind of things do you do to get ready? I don't do enough. My brother, the guitar player, he nonstop works out all the time. Uh, but for me, my main thing is like physically, I get into it more when we're on the road. Like, you know, the first show is like the breaking point of, okay, now I'm ready. Uh, but for my voice, I have to go and rehearse because I don't, I don't think I sing. I, I'm, a, I'm a screamer, but <laughs> I've been told by, by so-called experts that I scream in key, which is great or whatever that yeah. means. But, uh, the way I use the muscles in my throat, it's like working out. When I'm off the road and I get lazy and I don't rehearse, I lose my voice. I don't, I don't have the power. So like before this, I went like for a week straight by myself, singing to the, the albums or whatever in the studio, just screaming my head off and, and singing to the, so just to keep my voice in shape. Yeah, so but what kind of things do you do? like? When you're on the road and you're doing shows night after night, and being in a hardcore oh, band, yeah. I would imagine that puts quite a strain on your voice. It How kinda, do you like save it? It kind of sucks because there's things you do like to, to take the swelling down. I drink a lot of ginger tea afterwards, ginger or just straight ginger and hot water and honey. It's good for you, but it sucks because you can't 
join in a lot of the fun. He's like, oh, I got to be quiet because I can't blow my voice. Because in the bus, everybody's yelling and having fun and making jokes. And I wanted, sometimes I'll join and scream, then I can't speak the next day. And I'm like, all right, I got to stop. Yeah. See, I see mean. the sacrifices I make? <laughs> My band doesn't understand. I always wonder that because, I mean, to be a good singer and to come on stage night after night and have that power, yeah. especially as a hardcore band, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, nothing will come out if you're not resting. Sometimes it, it worked uh, It worked for me where, to my advantage even though, when, when uh, we didn't have as much melody in the songs like in our earlier career, uh, of our career, because I would go up and do shows where I would have just like sound like a cookie monster, which is a whole genre now. But I would just get up there and be, uh, and be you know, I'd have 103 fever and just go and play the show anyway. Yeah. But, you know, now we have, uh, you know, more m melody in the vocals for us. Uh, but I've had friends who would, they smoke, they drink, they could drink a cup of coffee before they go on stage and sing amazing. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're special then. That's yeah. not for everybody. <laughs> hardcore scene and being such legends in that being a band for 33 years can you talk about how the scene has evolved over the last yeah I mean like any scene it, it, it grew and it kind of lost its way a little bit we I mean there's bands like us and agnostic front we still hold true to that open-mindedness of it and yeah and then for a while New York lost its way where it got really into gang stupidity which I mean LA had that decades before us you know and 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 then that you know it kind of ruined it, but New York came back as like a family. All the bands look out for each other. Uh, you know, we kept the scene going. Freddie from Madball, uh, him and his crew started Black and Blue Productions and started putting on shows, and they're still doing shows. They do a big one called the Black and Blue Bowl, and then they do small shows all over. Even now, they're doing two of our shows in Florida, and they do them in upstate New York. So it's good. Everybody keeps trying to keep it alive, you know? I kind of noticed I, like uh, the hardcore kids, they dance the same stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Hardcore you know dancing is so weird. It, the dancing's evolved into some really weird stuff. When we started going, there was circle pits, and then there was like you know the the what do you, it looked like uh, smelly from from no, from no effects. So he goes, when they, when I watch kids from New York dance, look like they're fighting the air, and I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> then it, it got crazy, but now I think it's even weirder now. The generations, I don't know, three generations behind me, that the, the dancing is just I don't get it. It's just yeah. like running and punch your friend in the face and then run back. I mean, it's just it's like a really weird game of Red Rover. I don't know. Yeah, I was at a hardcore show in New York a few months ago, actually in Jersey. Uh -oh. And I would just, it was my, my favorite part was just watching the kids dance. I was like, what, what are they doing? <laughs> see, even my dad said that to me when he first came to see us play. He watched from the balcony and he just watched the crowd. Yeah. It's the best. Well, so lastly, can you share some of your standout moments from your career? I mean, you must have seen a lot of stuff. What oh, are some of the God. moments that are just we at have, the front of your mind? There's tons. I mean, <laughs> uh, the first time we ever played CBGBs, the first time headlining CBGBs, and we, we were driving, we came off the uh, Williamsburg Bridge, we were making a left onto Bowery, which the street CBGBs on, and we were like, man, I hope people show up. And there was a line around the block and we hadn't even got there to sound check yet. And that was amazing. That is but, you so know, I mean, cool. there's so much stuff like meeting uh, uh, Joe Strummer. We played in 90, 1999, we played festivals with him in Italy and in, you know, all over Europe. And having him stand there watching us and walk off the stage and he goes, holy shit, you guys are amazing. You're like, Joe Strummer just said we were amazing. And same thing with Tom Araya from Slayer. So we got both sides of the spectrum there, you know? That's so no, that's, awesome. That's, it's really good. You know? I mean, and then it's always just meeting people that tell you that your music has changed their lives or helped them. It's, you know, like every band, you're special to someone, and it's really good to know that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I'm no, excited to you. see you play tonight. I'm Lou from Sick of It All, and you're watching Last Rockers TV. Yeah.